Hi, I'm Lucia from Seattle, Washington, and I support Adoptees On because everyone deserves to know their own story. I'm inviting you to join me in supporting this podcast so we can reach more adoptees around the world and let them know they aren't alone. Join me over at adopteeson.com slash partner where any level of contribution helps. Thank you. You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. This is episode 195, Eliana Javed. I'm your host, Haley Radke. We are revisiting the topic of estrangement today. If you're new here, welcome. Earlier in the year, we did several episodes that examined estrangement and what made some of us decide to break contact with our adoptive families. I'll put a link in the show notes to the estrangement series for you. But when I was producing that series, I always wanted to have an episode where we could talk about what it would look like to go back to our adoptive family after a period of estrangement. Can you go back once you've left? Today, Eliana shares her experiences of reunion with her birth mother and what led to a decade-long estrangement from her adoptive family. She talks us through her decision-making process for reunification and healthy boundaries, and I was amazed to hear the depth of how she's looked back on this and processed all the things that have gone on. In fact, for almost the full first half of the episode, Eliana shares answers to questions I had before I even got to ask them. But before we get started, I do want to mention in this episode, we have several mentions of violence. We wrap up with some recommended resources for you. And as always, links to everything we'll be talking about today are on the website, adoptizon.com. Let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome to Adoptees On, Eliana Javed. Welcome, Eliana. Hi, Haley. Thanks for having me. I'm so pleased to talk with you and hear some of your story. Would you mind starting with that? Well, I'm a domestic adoptee. I was born in 1968, six weeks early in a county hospital in Portland, Oregon. So I spent my first two and a half weeks in the hospital and then a week in foster care. And then I was adopted to a family who had adopted a boy two years previously from the same agency. So I grew up with a brother and we didn't stay in Portland long. My family moved a tremendous amount. My father was in sales And every time they offered him a promotion, he took it, which meant a move across state lines. So by the time I was nine, I'd moved nine times. Wow. So for an adoptee, uh, especially, I had a huge sense of insecurity and instability in my life. But being the good adoptee that I was, my parents always praised me on my adaptability and my strength and how easily I made friends. So they never knew the inside world of what I was dealing with, of always being the new kid and being picked on because I was new and all of that stuff. It was very difficult, to say the least. But when I was nine, we moved to Memphis and my world kind of changed. I met my best friend. I Her mom became like my mom. They lived two doors down. So that was really hard on my parents because I spent most of my time at somebody else's house. But my parents were going through a very, very difficult part of their marriage, fighting a lot, drinking a lot, a lot of violence just between them, not against me. You know, my parents were actually pretty kind to me growing up, but they were they had a really hard time with each other. They loved each other, but a lot of drinking and a lot of yelling and a lot of fighting. And so those years in Memphis were the were the worst for that because of job instability. And so my best friend really got me through those times, but I didn't share with her what was going on in my personal life. I just spent a lot of time with her. So when I was 13, we moved again to Chicago. And of course that was devastating, but I did it and made a success of it as best I could. And then when I was 17, I was a junior in high school and getting ready to apply to colleges. I became absolutely obsessed with California I wanted to move to California. I want to go to college in California. My room was completely plastered every inch of my wall with bands I liked and beaches. And my parents said, no, they would not allow me to go to California for college. They wouldn't help me out. I I could go out of state, but not to California. So I picked another state that was closer and I went away to college four years and then came home and lived at home for a year trying to kind of get 
my feet underneath me and get a good job, whatever, all of that. And I think after being away for four years, not living in that environment for four years, when I came back home, it was almost intolerable to live with that. It was, it was just such a toxic environment. And I really struggled that year. It was hard for me. So my best friend came from Memphis to visit me. One time we went out for dinner. We came home and there was a hole punched in the door in my parents' bedroom. And my dad's standing there all disheveled and angry. And my mom cowering in the guest room. And I said, okay, let's go to bed. And my friend said, what? What do you mean, let's go to bed? Like, you've got to go check on your mom. And I said, no, I don't. And she said, yes, you do. You've got to go check on your mom. I said, well, okay, I didn't want to. So I went in there. You okay, mom? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. So I said, okay, she's fine. Let's go to bed. And we're laying in bed. And she said, how can you act like this is okay? Like this is normal. And I said, this is normal. I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, but this has happened before. And she said, why didn't you tell me all these years? I never knew this happened in your house. And I said, well, you know, there's a lot of shame around this kind of behavior. And I didn't feel comfortable sharing it. I didn't feel comfortable talking about it. So I just pretended it didn't exist. I mean, that was my whole life, right? Pretending I'm not adopted, pretending I fit in everywhere I go, pretending my parents aren't arguing, pretend, pretend, pretend. That was my life. So a few months passed and my brother, who was married at the time, well, he's still married, was married to another adoptee who was already in reunion. And they came over for dinner one night because I was living with my parents still. And my brother says to my parents, I just want to let you know, I wrote to the adoption agency for my non-identifying information. That's a mouthful I'd never heard of before. And my jaw hit the ground. I said, what do you mean your non-identifying information? Like, what is that? Like, we can do that? I didn't know I had any rights to know anything We didn't ever really talk about adoption. We always knew we were adopted, but it wasn't a subject my parents ever were comfortable talking about or having us talk about. So I said, well, I want to do that. And my dad's face, I'll never forget my dad's face. I'd never seen this look on my dad's face. And my dad and I, despite the violence that happened between my parents, my dad and I were very close, was much closer to my dad than my mom. My mom, I just had a really hard time getting close to. And my dad looked at me and he said, well, when you call the adoption agency, they're going to tell you when you were 17, they sent a letter from your birth mother to us. And it said that she lived in California and she was open to meeting you if you ever wanted to meet her. He said, but I saw what you were going through when you were 17. You wanted to move to California more than anything in the world. And I figured if I gave you this letter you wouldn't go to college. You just moved to California and move in with her. So I threw the letter away. And Haley, until that moment, I didn't even know that I cared that much about my birth mother. I don't even think I'd thought that much about her. And my whole world tilted. I felt like I'd gone into another universe. And all these emotions that I never knew I was feeling flooded me. And I said, can you excuse me for a minute? I need to go to the bathroom. So I closed the door in the bathroom and I had so much energy in me. I had to jump up and down to kind of get it out of me. And I realized for the first time in my life that I had a huge fear about being rejected from my birth mother. I didn't know I felt that way. And this letter assaged me of that worry that my birth mother wanted to know me. And so this journey began. I I decided to write the adoption agency, get my non-identifying medical information, any information I could. And they said, well, your, your birth mother has been in correspondence with us for years. And she's given us her addresses through the years as she's moved. And now that you have signed all the documents and we've tried to cannot, con- contact her, she's moved again and not updated her information. So I had to wait. So it was two years waiting. I'd moved out in the, in the interim of that. I moved out of my parents' house down to downtown Chicago. I lived in an apartment with friends. I had a job. I was making really, really poor decisions as far as who I was hanging out with, activities I was involved in, the people I was choosing to be around. I was just self-destructing. 
I was reading adoption and reunion books, everything I could find and um, crying myself to sleep every night. You know, that was pretty much how I spent my time. And I just felt like when I finally find my people, they're going to save me from myself because I'm getting ready to go down into a dark place that I'm not sure I'm going to come out of. So luckily, uh, my birth mother and I did get reunited and we talked for a month on the phone and it was a very loving connection. And she asked me honestly, you know, how was my childhood? And we'd had so many conversations for so many hours, I wasn't able to pretend it anymore. And so I had to tell her what I dealt with growing up and the darkness that I dealt with. And she was very, very upset. And she said that she thinks my parents possibly are alcoholics, one or both. And it would help me if I went to Al-Anon. I went to three Al-Anon meetings and sat in the back and bawled my eyes out and went, oh my gosh, there's like a name for what I dealt with. These other people have been through this. I didn't know I was in the dark about this. So anyway, it came time to meet my birth mother. And I don't know about other adoptees, but the way that I had to be in the world around my family and the friends I had, I had an armor on top of me. It wasn't really who I was. It was protection. So I needed a safe place to be where I could, I didn't really know who I was, but I knew it wasn't this person. So I thought, where can I go? Okay, my best friend's house. So I called her, can we go to your parents' house in Memphis? Can we meet there? Yes. So I met my birth mother at my best friend's house for four days. We we met. It was, uh, I was very dissociated during that meeting time, which was hard for me to be that cut off. But I tried my best to be present. I, I wasn't. But she was asking me when I was there, what is your plan going forward? And I said, well, next month, my lease is up. My roommates are all scattering. I have no plan. I've sold my car already because I only take the train. She said, why don't you move in with me and your grandmother? We just bought a place in the Santa Cruz Mountains. We have a farmhouse. We have room for you. I said, okay. I didn't give it a second thought. And I had a great plan to tell my adopted family. I, I was in the process. Of, of course, anybody that's making really poor decisions in their life and is really lost and insecure and not sure how to stand strong on their own two feet should apply to the Peace Corps. That was my plan. I was like halfway through my process of going to a third world country, which in hindsight was not a good thought. But I thought, OK, this is just great. I'll tell them. I'm going to move in with my birth mother and grandmother while I'm awaiting my Peace Corps assignment. And then I get to know them before I leave for two years. So I told them that. They accepted it. They drove me to the airport with everything I owned in four suitcases. And off I went with this naive sense of everything's going to be great now. Now my life's going to be great. So you can imagine what happened. So I get into the new house, we get settled and there's pictures of her life everywhere, her life without me, right? Her adventurous life. She's traveling. She's windsurfing. She's rock climbing. All this stuff she couldn't have done towing a little kid around, especially as a single mother. And so the rage and the grief and the resentment that I felt, I wasn't prepared for. I didn't know how to handle it. It was the most intense feeling I'd ever felt in my life. So the farmhouse was not too big and there were two bedrooms. So my grandmother was in one bedroom and we shared a bed in the other room. Well, that's a really bizarre experience as an adult when you feel like a baby and you're laying next to your mom that you never knew. And so I wanted to just like lay on top of her and hear her heartbeat, just like my babies did with me. You know, that's what I wanted. So I would ask her, can I lay on top of you? I know this is weird. I'm 24 years old and I'm all grown up, but I need that. I can't stop myself from wanting that. It's like this primal urge that is coming out of me. And so she needed it too. And so she was like, okay, that's fine. So every night for months and months, I would lay on top of her and listen to her heartbeat and just cry my eyes out and try to figure out why I was still falling apart because I thought I'd be better now. I found my people, I should be better now. But I was getting worse. 
And this is 1993. There's not resources, really. I'd read every book I could find, but nothing was really helpful to me. So I was age regressing, you know, very badly. I was age regressing and I was having anxiety. I'd started getting panic attacks. So she took me to the bookstore one day and she said, let's see if there's any new books. Well, I found The Primal Wound. And I said, oh, this wasn't around last time I was at the bookshop. So I bought that book and I went home, read it cover to cover, bawling my eyes out the whole time. And when I did some deeper research on the back cover, I realized Nancy Verrier lived an hour and a half from me. So we called her up, made a therapy appointment with her. My mother and I went there and told Nancy what was going on with me. And she said, yes, a lot of this is definitely adoptee related. Some of this is not. Some of this is childhood abuse related. And you're going to need to delve into that to do your healing work. So we left Nancy's office. I started therapy. Regular talk therapy didn't help me. I did that for a while. Then somebody mentioned EMDR, which I'd never heard of before. And luckily, there was a woman in town right near my house that was trained in it. So I started EMDR, and the panic attacks got better, and the anxiety got better. Of course, none of it was centered around my relinquishment. It was all about my childhood, which was okay. I mean, it was still a lot of healing work that was done. So what was happening at this time is I was realizing that I could not stay in touch with my parents anymore because as this stuff is surfacing and I'm trying to heal from it and then I'm trying to do my weekly Sunday call to them, I can't do it anymore. I can't break into two people anymore. I didn't have that ability anymore to do it. I couldn't put my armor on and be who I wasn't anymore. could not pretend. So I, I told my birth mother I need to go back home one more time because there's things at home that I want. And I'm going to go home for Christmas. And it's going to be the last time I'll ever see my family or ever talk to them. Because when I return, I'm going to let them know that I don't want them in my life anymore. So I took too long to schedule the flight because I was so upset about it that I ended up, instead of staying six days, I had to stay closer to two weeks, which was, I just couldn't even fathom that I had to spend that much time there. But that's what happened. So I was asking my birth mother, how do I hang on to who I've become? It's so fragile and tender, this new person I've become. I don't know how to hang on to it when I go back there. I feel like I'm falling back in the well again. So we came up with this plan. So at night when we were laying in bed, she would read me a book by Rudyard Kipling called The Elephant's Child. And it was a book that her mother read to her when she was a little girl. And I loved it. And she read it to me often. And so she said, what if I record myself reading this story to you? And you can take that cassette tape home with you and bring your Walkman. And when you feel like you're falling into the well and you've forgotten who you've become, you can listen to me and you can remember where you came from and you can remember the person you're trying to be. And so that's what we did. And I took that recording with me and I listened to it every night. And my parents, they could definitely tell I was changing. I was not the same person. And it was a weird visit. But I put on a new armor that I'd never worn before, like my warrior armor that was something I constructed during that year and a half in California. And I said, I have a mission. I went downstairs through shoeboxes of old pictures, got all the pictures that meant something to me. And I went upstairs and I asked my dad, where are our legal files? And he showed me the legal filing cabinet. And I said, I need my birth certificate. And he said, well, you can't have it. And I said, well, why not? I need it. And he said, why do you need it? I said, well, because I don't live here anymore. I need to have my birth certificate. He said, well, it's mine. And I said, no, it's not yours. It's mine. And he said, no, I own it. And I said, okay, you know, I'm not going to fight about this. So, of course, I just waited for my dad to leave the house. And then I took my birth certificate. So I had all my little contraband in my suitcase ready to depart for the last time from my family. So my dad drove me to the airport and I said goodbye as if no big deal. And I got back home and I had lost so much weight because all I could eat was black licorice pretty much the whole time I was there. 
And I was in this emotional fetal position that when I went to the gym with my birth mother, because we like to work out together, I couldn't even open my arms up. And she said, what happened to you when you were there? It's like you've shrunk into this tiny little skeleton. And I said, well, I had to do what I had to do to get through it. And that's what I had to do. I had to just go inside of myself. And I couldn't really eat or move. I had to be really quiet and still inside of myself to deal with this. So as I continued healing, my parents would call. I wouldn't answer the phone. I wouldn't call them on Sundays. Then one day my dad called and left a really angry, scary voicemail. You know, why I'm avoiding him, blah, 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 all this stuff. And I told my birth mother, that's it. That's my final straw. I'm done. It's time to write the letter. I'm ready. So I wrote the letter. Those of us that have been estranged probably are aware of this letter. And I said, I need space away from you. The alcohol and the violence have made me feel unsafe and insecure in this family. And it's time for me to step back away from you. I need you to honor my space and not contact me again. And that was it. I mailed it. I never heard from them. They didn't call me. They didn't write. They left me alone. And I thought I would feel so much better, like relief. And there was some relief, but I felt this kind of fear, like they were just going to show up and invade my privacy and ask me a bunch of questions that I wasn't prepared to answer and force me to talk to them about why I did what I did. So I was constantly looking over my shoulder uh, in fear that they were going to show up and pressure me. They didn't. They never did contact me. So many years pass and I got married. I had three children. I just kind of put a lot of this on the back burner, although I still had healing work I had to, to do. It still came up. I got triggered all the time by my birth mother. So I had to constantly deal with that. And my birth father, who I haven't talked much about, who I was also in reunion with, didn't live in the state, but he would come sometimes at Christmas to visit his family that was in Sacramento. So he came to visit me one time and he knew I wasn't speaking to my parents. And he asked me, are you still not speaking to your parents? And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, do you think you'll ever speak with them again? And I said, no, I don't plan on it. And he said, well, I'll tell you this. I have friends who have chosen that route and they cut their parents out of their life and then their parents passed away and they were left holding this wound that was very difficult for them to deal with because the hope of some sort of reconciliation that maybe they weren't even aware they had had died with that and are you prepared for that I said I, I don't know I don't really want to talk to him again you know my same answer and he said well I know that things happened in your life that that we're not good for you and we're not healthy for you. But just know that they were there when I wasn't. I couldn't be there. I couldn't do what they did. So just think about it. You don't have to do anything, but just think about that. And he left and I thought about it. So for about six months, I did a lot of journaling and a lot of writing and thinking. And I started thinking about all the good times that we had. I had spent the last... 11 and a half years thinking about all the horrible times that I just bottled up and pushed away. Now I started thinking about what about the good times? What about the love we shared? What about the happiness that I did have around them? What about all the things my mom did for me that I really hate doing for my own children? And I begrudge that I've got to do it. I hate making their lunches every single day. I hate hate, hate getting their Halloween costumes every year. I don't know why I hate that, but I hate it. All these things. And my mother did all of that for me and never batted an eye, never said a negative word about it, was just there for me. And I started realizing, you know, I think there's some, I think there's some good here. I don't think it was all bad. I think it was just, I pushed the bad away for so long that I had to focus on it to heal from it. And I feel like I've done that. And now I'm ready to move forward. And my husband had always encouraged me to take a deeper look at all of this. And did I really want to stay estranged the rest of my life? So I, I talked to him and I said, you know, I think I'm ready to write another letter. I think it's time. 
So I gathered up all the stuff I'd written over the last 11 and a half years, which was significant amount of stuff, you know, journals and journals and journals full of my darkest, most horrible thoughts and feelings. And I put it all in a bucket in my driveway and I burned it. And I said, I'm done. I have walked into my past for so long. I don't need to process it anymore. I'm done processing this. I'm ready to live now for now and for my future. So I wrote another letter and I said, I have decided that I would like you back in my life if you're willing to be in my life. And I'm sorry for any pain I may have caused you by stepping out. That's just what I needed to do at the time. And just my phone number if you ever want to reach out to me. So I kissed the letter. My kids kissed the letter. My husband kissed the letter. We said a prayer on it and we mailed it. And four days later, my phone rang and it was my parents. And I hadn't talked to them in 10 years. They sounded different. They sounded older. You know, my brother had had children. It's like all these things had happened in their life that I was not a part of. But they... They welcomed me back with open arms. They didn't want to dwell on the past. I didn't want to dwell on the past. We talked about it very little. And we decided that we were going to reconnect in the places where we could reconnect. So I decided to have very, very strict guidelines about where I felt safe with them. And I felt safe in the daytime with them before cocktail hour. So I would not call them after four o'clock. I would talk to them only once a week. And we actually talked quite a bit those first weeks. And they got excited about coming out to meet their grandchildren. So I said, okay, you can come out. You have to stay at a hotel. So they stayed at a hotel. We would meet them in the morning and we'd have this wonderful time together. And if their behavior started getting out of control to what I felt safe with, I would just say, oh, I got to go. I have an appointment. It's time to leave. And I'd pack the kids up and off we'd go. And then if we invited them over for dinner, I would not provide alcohol at dinner. And if any kind of arguing happened, I'd say, oops, it's time for the kids to go to bed. It's time for me to go answer the phone or whatever. And I just decided that I don't have to stay in environments that aren't healthy for me, but it doesn't mean that I have to give up the whole environment. I don't have to throw out everything just because there's pieces that aren't healthy for me. So I found a way to connect to my parents and it was beautiful. It was satisfying, which I never thought I would put those words in the same sentence as my parents. But we had a wonderful, wonderful reunion together. And after about a few years, my mother and I started talking on the phone, long time, hour long conversations. And she and I developed a closeness we'd never had. And we just talked about the day and what we were doing. I was folding laundry, you know, nothing deep. I mean, they weren't people that could delve deep. That's fine. I went to therapy for deep. I went to my husband for deep. Mm -hmm. I went to my friends for deep. I didn't need my parents for that. So we connected where we could. And then seven years after my reunion, she developed dementia and I started losing her little by little. And those seven years I had with her, I really, I cherish every minute of it because once she started down that road of dementia, she changed. And two and a half years ago, she passed away and I was by her side those last four days of her life. And they were magical days to spend with her. I felt honored to be with her. And my father was so happy that I was there because it was so hard for him. And I, I, I then I, I made another way to be there. I started meditating sometimes twice a day, whatever I had to do to stay healthy. I left the house. I worked out. I took walks. I did all of these things that I needed to do in order to be present, fully present, but not put in situations where I was feeling unsafe or unhappy. I mean, it's weird to say that I was happy as my mother was dying. I wouldn't say happy is the right word, but when you're with somebody at the most precious time in their life, which is birth and death, there's there's something about holding space for somebody when they're in that moment. 
And I, I'm, I was so honored to be one of those people that could be there for her and really help her transition over. And it's one of, it's one of my fondest memories of my life, which I'm surprised by, but I, I found much healing in being there for her at that time. So, and then what happened is after she passed away, my dad didn't have that partner to argue with, although he loved my mom. They just, that was their communication style. So then my dad and I started to become close, much closer than we were. And he stopped drinking because the medication he was on didn't work with the alcohol. So now he's completely sober. And I love talking to my father. Does he bug me and does he complain sometimes? Yeah, of course. But we really enjoy each other. We have carved out a very healthy relationship. Now, he comes out here for two and three weeks at a time, which can be a lot and sometimes drives me crazy. And when he starts down that road, I just say, you know, Dad, I have to go. It's time for me to go. You can go back to your room and I'll talk to you later. Or when it's time to go out to eat, which is always a problem for him. I say, okay, dad, I'll go out to eat with you, but here's my guidelines. You may not complain about the restaurant we're going to. You may not switch seats after we have seated ourselves. You may not complain about the waitress or the lighting. You may not complain about the food selection. Or I'm not going to go with you because it makes me miserable. And so he grumbles a little bit, but he does it he wants to be with me. And he knows I mean business. I didn't talk to him for 10 years. So he knows when I say this is, this is how I feel. And I need this from you. He knows that's a hard line for me. And so my father respects my boundaries more because I put such a hard line up for so long. And I have to say, I'm truly, truly happy now around my parents well, my dad now is the only one. I can say that I'm happy around him. Has he changed? A little bit. Have I changed? Tremendously. So I just, I learned that there's ways to be with people to bring out what's good still and not to be around the stuff that's not healthy. I used to think if it wasn't all good, I couldn't be around it. But I've learned there's a lot of gray in the world. And if you give up everything it's gray, you're not left with very much. And I wanted the gray. I wanted to pick out all the healthy parts that were in the gray. And so that's what I've worked hard on doing. And, and your podcast has changed my life. I discovered it a year ago. And I didn't know there was adoptee land. That was something I wasn't familiar with. I didn't know there were other adoptees out there that felt like I did. I certainly didn't know there were adoptees that were estranged from their adoptive families. So when I started listening to this podcast, it opened a whole new world for me of reaching out to people that were going through what I had been through and that some people just need to know they're not alone, that a lot of us have walked this journey and it's lonely and it's scary and it's extremely sad. And so I feel like I have purpose in my suffering now because I can offer support to people that are suffering in their own pain the way that I was. So I'm just very blessed. I feel very blessed for this journey I've been on. And I feel like I'm done dealing with the past and I'm ready for my future. Your story is so inspiring, Eliana. I truly, I understand the level of commitment to working on yourself to strengthen yourself to choose yourself to have healthy boundaries in order to interact with people who are a toxic influence on us like that is so significant I just don't want I feel like the decade it was like you know in order to move to the the story you know for the whole decade that is such a long time to um choose you wow it's a long time. It was a long time. It was, a. it was, you know, I've thought a lot about, was this the right amount of time to stay estranged? I went back and forth with regret for a while. Oh my gosh, I missed the birth of my nephews. I missed all of these events. Should I have gone back sooner? But the truth is, is that I wasn't ready. 
I, I wasn't ready to let them in yet. So, and when my best friend came back to visit, when I was reunited with my family, she said, you know, I know you had regrets about it being 10 years, but I see that your parents have changed. They're not exactly the same as they were before. And maybe they needed 10 years to make them understand that they needed to change a little bit. So I don't know. I've let go of the regret because I'm happy with where I am now. So I don't have that regret anymore, but I did for a while. It's very hard because, like I said, with estrangement, you feel like you should feel so so much relief. But you just feel disconnected the same way I did with my birth family before I knew them. It was just I'm floating alone again. So it's like that familiar ache of being alone and having to just be by yourself again. So I don't know. Estrangement's a hard one. It's hard to to find the right place to feel okay in it because it doesn't feel okay, but it's what I had to do in order to heal. It's a hard choice. Do you mind sharing about how you um, communicated your choices to your children? Choices about? Well, you were already estranged once you got married and started having children. Is that right? Mm Mm-hmm. That's right. So then when you decided to write a letter to your adoptive parents, you said you all gave it a kiss before you sent it off. So what did you tell your children? That was a tricky scenario because my birth mother shared things with them that I wouldn't have shared. Because I think the piece I'm not sharing in this story, because I'm really focusing on my estrangement and reconciliation is the whole piece between my birth mother and my adoptive parents. And my birth mother was really angry that they had raised me the way that they had. And so she kind of would sometimes uh, allude to the difficulties that I grew up with. So my kids would hear that from her. And so they kind of would hear that, oh, your parents were difficult and they drank a lot and this and that. And So I didn't talk that much about my adoptive parents to my kids. My birth mother did a little bit here and there. And, you know, that's a whole nother episode of diving into that one. We don't have time for that today. (laughs) But I would just tell my kids that, yes, you know, there were difficult times with my parents and I needed to step away from them in order to do some of my own healing. You know, I was very open with my kids about what adoption was like for me and what reunion was like. So they were aware from the time they were old enough to really understand any of it, uh, what I went through. And so when it was time to reconcile, I said, you know, yeah, my parents did some things that weren't great, but they're, they're good people. They just made some mistakes and I'm your parent and I've made plenty of mistakes. I want to be forgiven for my mistakes. You know, I wasn't perfect to you guys. I did the best I could, but Some things I did, I wish I didn't. And I don't want to be the person then that just never allows them back in my life because I'm not willing to forgive them. I love them. I want to forgive them. Forgiveness doesn't mean that I think it's okay what they did, but I think there's a way that we can all feel good and be together again and create a relationship. And you can have more grandparents in your life and more love in your life. And why is that a bad thing? It's not. This has to be safe. So, and I'm in charge of that. I will make it safe for everybody. So nobody feels unsafe. And, you know, we had a few little minor blips here and there, but for the most part, you know, it was, it was pretty good. When I hear you describe um, this story and your choices, I feel like your preparation was so well done that did that provide you some sense of safety? Like if things don't go the way I hope, and if I'm not able to hold this specific line, I know I can choose, okay, it's, we're not able to do this. And I can choose again to choose me and my family. And mm-hmm. did, did you feel like you had that permission sort of already put in yourself? 
That's a really good question. I don't know if I consciously thought about it that way, but I did know that there were options. I didn't feel trapped, you know, and my husband was an amazing support. So I always knew that I had him 100% behind me and whatever I needed to decide to be safe, I would have his support. And so I think having him behind me, it gave me even a, a greater sense of we can make this work. And he came from a really big family with all kinds of family issues. And this person's not talking to that person and that person's not talking to this person. And so he was really a proponent in let's just try to see if we can get along instead of always be mad at one another and hold grudges and not talk to each other. He said, because that just leads to people dying and then regret. So I kept getting this message from different people in my life. And I thought, okay, I think I can make this work. I think I can have safe boundaries. But if not, I've done it before where I don't have them in my life. So I can do it again. And they don't live right next door. You know, we're in different states. So that made it even easier for me. So I guess that was a safety net for me that I could always go back and say, nope, oops, I thought I could do it. Sorry, you know, I can't hold the line as much as I expected to. My parents wanted me back in their life so badly. I think they would have done just about anything. I really think that they missed me so much. You know, they really, really loved me. They weren't perfect. They had a lot of faults. But not loving me was not part of it. They were very loving parents. They just were a victim of their disease. And they didn't do any of their own healing work. So, but but I never felt like I wasn't loved. That wasn't part of it. Thank you for sharing that. I don't often ask about the other people <laughs> in the equation, but I'm curious about how you approached your brother who was also adopted because it sounded to me like you were separated from him as well during this mm -hmm. estrangement period. Yes, that's true. And that was very, very painful, not only for my brother, but his wife, who I was extremely close to and was also an adoptee. They were much slower to welcome me back. They were hurt in a deeper way because they have their own abandonment issues, as any adoptee does. And I think it took them longer. They, they welcomed me back, but they held me at arm's length for a while. And I think still to this day, I feel like I'm being held at arm's length by them. And I don't know if they're aware of it, that they're doing this. I'm not sure. But I feel in a way like I've been a little bit held back from being as close to them as I want to be because of the hurt that I instilled when I said goodbye to them. I think adoptees have a much harder time with being told to go away than the average person, which makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I've made a lot of amends and in that relationship, but I can feel that there's a little bit of a closed door there as much as they love me. I feel like they didn't open their heart up again to me. Mm. Well, before we do recommended resources, I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit more on the healing things you did. You said you did a lot of reading, you did EMDR, which you hadn't mm. even heard of, and that was a thing. And if there's anything else that you want to share about things that you did, because I'm sure when people hear how you speak, they will be like, oh, my word, I want what she's having. <laughs> yeah, OK. Well, my healing journey took a very long time. I, I would say the first three years were the most intense. And so the things that I did, because I lived in the country, I took a tennis racket to the top of the mountain that I lived on and I beat the rocks with a tennis racket and screamed at the top of my lungs several times. I also did a lot of uh, nature walking, time in nature, and singing in nature. I grew up in the church and the church I grew up in was a cappella singing. And when I was 16, I, I just decided no more church. I don't like the church. I don't believe in their doctrine. And so I left the church 
But because I'd grown up in it, the the singing, the a cappella singing is what I felt so connected. So I'd go out in nature and I would sing my church songs that I remembered to the trees. And that would bring me such peace and such a feeling of connectedness. So spending a lot of time in nature and letting out my anger, those were really key pieces for me. And I stayed physically active. You know, I worked out a lot. I went to the ocean a lot and just sat and listened to the waves. And one thing that really helped me, I needed touch more than I needed air, it felt like. And so my therapist recommended a body worker that it wasn't like a massage therapist. It was, I mean, she did a massage, but she was a body worker and it was a, it was like an energetic exchange. Like she would put on this Tibetan monk music and she'd light incense and she would do this kind of gentle massage work all over me. And I just felt like surrounded by love and I just had to have it. It was like critical for me to heal that that wounded baby part that needed touch so badly. It was like the most necessary thing I could imagine. I wanted that over food. I mean, I just, I I was touch deprived. That was probably the two and a half weeks in the hospital. I'm sure I didn't get much touching during that time. And um, those sessions were very healing for me. And I kind of forgotten about it until you asked this question. But that was a really big piece of my healing, my sensory healing. And I felt like it stopped some of the fight or flight pieces that were active in me. So uh, let me see. Besides that, of course, I did therapy. Therapy was, EMDR was the only thing I found helpful out of therapy. Talk therapy, in my opinion, was a waste of my time. But they didn't talk about relinquishment stuff then anyway. And then a ton, a tremendous amount of reading. I read every adoption book I could find. Sometimes, multiple times, I would read and journal. And besides that, hmm, trying to think if there was anything else. My husband used to say to me, let's go to Yosemite. And when you see the rocks there, they're going to imprint something in your mind that when you lay down at night and you close your eyes to go to sleep, you're going to see that. You're going to see those rocks. You're going to see that sky. You're going to feel that wind and you're going to feel peaceful because you've changed your scenery. And so that would often help because I still, in the beginning of my marriage, I still was struggling a lot with my healing work. I was still very vulnerable, crying a lot, triggered a lot. I mean, my poor husband, I can't even believe the stuff he put up with. But he did. He'd been through his own dark days. And so he knew that that if he just kept loving me, eventually I would be able to handle him saying something to me without me bursting into tears. So, you know, that that, it, that took a long time, but it did happen recently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry it took that long. But for me, it took a really long time. Mm. Well, I think so much of this work is is just lifelong. I'm sorry to say, right? Na- yeah, Nancy Verrier did tell me during our session that uh, she did not feel that the primal wound was something that could be completely healed. And I remember thinking a year and a half into reunion that that was not going to be my case. I was going to completely heal from my primal wound. I was going to show her that she was not correct in that. I was going to heal mine all the way. And that's been 26 years ago, she told me that. And I'm still dealing with healing that piece of me. So I think Nancy probably was correct. But I do feel that it can be greatly reduced in how much it rules my daily life and how much I feel in control of my emotions I don't, I'm not so reactive anymore. Sometimes I am around my birth mother. Still, it's hard, but around just the average person in my life, I don't feel that I'm reactive anymore. So that, that part is good. I love that. All right. Well, I am so, I don't know. I had goosebumps when you were talking and telling your story and 
So I'm so thankful that you were willing to share that with us. And, you know, prior to our interview, I was reading a little bit of things that you had sent me that you had written and didn't get burned in the trash can. I'm sure you wrote them more recently. <laughs> But you mentioned IFS, and so I remember that there um, that the creator of IFS, Richard Schwartz, has a new book out called No Bad Parts, Healing Trauma and Restoring Wholeness with the Internal Family Systems Model. And we've had a therapist come on the podcast and talk about that. And even when you were talking about your healing work and uh, sort of the, the body work and knowing that your baby, Eliana, needed that physical touch. Um, I think there is something really amazing about parts work for um, adopted people. And the more I hear from adoptee therapists about IFS, the more I'm convinced of that. So I wanted to recommend that. Now, here's my caveat. Uh, I have not read it yet. I've ordered it and I thought I would have it in time for <laughs> for our conversation, but no. Uh, but I'm so confident that it would be helpful, especially for those of you who haven't heard of IFS before and you're like, oh, what is that? Um, it's the internal family systems model. And if you go back on the Adoptees On feed, we have several episodes with Marta Sierra about IFS and how beneficial it can be for adoptees. So that's what I'm recommending. No Bad Parts by Dr. Schwartz. What did you want to recommend to us? Well, for me, my oldest son gave me a little book called The Four Agreements a couple of years ago. And I read it maybe last year, and it has completely changed my life. I don't think I've ever read a book that changed my life more than this book. Uh, it's it's not that big of a book. It's kind of surprising how life changing it is. So the first agreement is to be impeccable with your word, which basically means don't judge or blame yourself or others. That words are powerful. So be careful how you use them. And the second one is uh, don't ever take anything personally, because nothing really has to do with you that other people are saying it's about them. And I never realized I took everything personally. Every single thing would like be an arrow to my heart. And until I read that, I didn't realize that I was like that. And the third agreement is to make no assumptions, but to have the courage to ask questions. And I realized that I made assumptions because I was terrified of questions and answers. I didn't want to know answers because I was always scared that I'd done something wrong. I was always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And I didn't want to ask people what was wrong because I was so scared they were going to say it was me. I did something wrong. I was bad. I made the mistake. And so I didn't realize I was living in constant fear of everything. And not making assumptions freed me up and to ask questions. So I loved that. And then the fourth agreement is to do your very best every day with these three agreements. You won't always be perfect, but to make a commitment every day. And I, I do this every day. I wake up and I, I think this. And if somebody says something to me that before maybe would have rubbed me the wrong way, now I just say to myself, eh, that has nothing to do with me. And it rolls right off of me. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't get me all ignited in my fight or flight. I don't feel all day like I have to ruminate, like, what did they mean? And why did they say it this way? And do they not like me anymore? And I don't do any of that anymore. And so what's happened is it's freed up all this space inside of me to actually be 100% present in my daily life because I'm not worried all the time that somebody's mad at me. My God, how much of my life have I spent worried that somebody's mad at me? 95% of it. So this little tiny little book has changed my life. That's amazing. Thank you. I'd heard of it before, but I didn't know. I, I hadn't looked any further. So I, thank you for sharing what the, the four agreements are. I will um, link to that in the show notes as well. But where can we connect with you online? Well, I am on social media, but I'm more of a person that responds to other people in supportive ways. So if you go to any of my stuff, it's not very active. So email is really, if you want to interact with me, probably my email is the best way. Perfect. I will put that in the show notes for folks. So if you want to email Eliana, you are welcome to. 
Thank you so much. This was a real honor to hear your journey from estrangement to reconnection. It was really powerful. Well, you know, I so appreciate you allowing me to share because it it hasn't been before that I have looked back and pieced all this together until now. And so now I feel like my journey is really complete because I've seen the whole thing. And I really appreciate you giving me that opportunity, not only for my own healing, but then maybe some hope for people that are sitting on the fence and wondering for themselves what, what that might look like for them. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I just have two things I want to tell you really quickly. So if you're listening when this episode is first released, it's November, which I deem the dreaded National Adoption Awareness Month because if you are on social and in adoption or adoptee activism whatsoever, it is freaking everywhere. Every post is about adoption. Can I get a minute? Like my word, it is too, too much. So instead of like adding on and being like, hey, do this prompt every day and here's your happy face hand, not into that. Um, Instead, we wanted to give you a way you could indicate to other adopted people that you're an ally, that you are willing to give some measure of support if they need it, or you're ready to chat in your DMs about any adoptee stuff that's kind of popping up for folks, or if you're looking for support in some way. Um, We started, we, my friend Reshma and I, so she runs the fabulous website Dear Adoption, where adopted people write letters to adoption expressing their thoughts and feelings. I've written a couple of letters uh, myself. And um, so we have collaborated to do a hashtag Dear Adoptees campaign for November. And I say campaign, that sounds so official. It is not meant that way. We are just going to share some posts throughout the month. No planned schedule, just here and there with a little prompt, a little graphic. And honestly, you can just repost the graphic, you know, use the hashtag Dear Adoptees if you want us to see it. Don't worry if you don't. Don't worry if your account's on private. It's not a big deal. Um, You are just showing other adopted people that you are here and willing to, you know, make space for them. And you can use it as a prompt and like write a little caption and blog or, or write something about it. Or you can just repost, you know, no pressure. Or you can just see it in your feed and think, oh, good there's another adoptee that feels nice. Like, I mean, (laughs) no pressure. Um, So you can follow Adoptees On on Instagram. We're at Adoptees On, any social media, all the links are in the show notes, like I always say. But like, if you just type in Adoptees On, like we'll pop up, which is awesome. Um, And second, I want to extend a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters, Um, I'm almost at 300 supporters, which is amazing. And I really, really, really just desperately want the show to be sustainable. And so we are able to grow and reach more adopted people around the world with um, support and more resources. And it's just so, so important to me. So every time someone signs up, it just like grows the capability and sustainability of the podcast. And Eliana is actually one of my supporters. So thank you so, so much. I couldn't do it without your generous support. And my little rant is, it's not fair. It's not fair that adoptees are paying for adoptee support. It's not fair that we kind of have to do that. But it is what it is. Because the adoption agencies aren't paying for it. The government is not paying for it. So... Those folks who have stepped up and supported the show in that way, I just, I feel so truly, truly grateful for you and the way you help make the show continue. So thank you so much. And if you want to join them, you can go to adoptiesoncom slash partner for more details of the bonuses that you get for supporting the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Let's talk again next Friday.